So, of course, the idea about uh, composition is that very, very, very often people, very often, almost always, people go by the subject thinking that, let's say, a uh, depiction of roses is a good painting because it's nice, it's cute, it's this and that. But that doesn't make it a good painting. What makes it, let's say, a crucifixion is a horror in the sense of what is depicted, okay? And yet, it's a great painting. So there's a big difference between cute, na maganda, na decorative, and another is a great piece of art. Roses can be great, great art too, but it's not the subject itself. If you learn about composition, which I'll try to explain as far as I can uh, convey it to you, there is this thing about how things are put together. This is what uh, composition can be, uh, must be uh, achieved. Uh, Yes, elements of good composition, of course, is in the contrast, in the rhythms, in the intensity, in the tone, in the color, in the division, the shapes, and uh, interlinkages. Very, very simple rules apply. That anything you put that is uh, leaning towards the corners, the four corners, We'll get, oh yes, the basic thing is to keep the eye interested within the painting, okay? We have no zooms, we have no spotlights, we don't have anything, we have just the painting, and it's a two-dimensional painting, and that's it. So we have to use these things, and uh, the ancients have used it uh, for, for centuries, and all art in all the whole world have to follow that, otherwise the, the eye goes away and it's not interested, okay? Another thing is also, even, uh, Diagonals, uh, dividing exactly uh, spaces, the main spaces. Also, that's wrong. Or, you see, these are, are the same, the same size. Also, that uh, it, it, it brings the uh, the eye out. What I'm used to very much is, let's say, this is a mountain. You know, this is a mountain, and then uh, the clouds seem to be afraid of the mountain. You know, they don't hit it. That's it. That's very, very amateurish because, or a house and trees, they, uh, the tree will go around the house, you know, and uh, so immediately you can spot a, a bad painting by, 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 by that sense. Okay, but see how these parallels here, how strong they are, and then they recede, they recede, and you practically uh, only see her face and everything else is roundness, roundness, and roundness, and she's in black, not by chance. It's really, this is planned to the very smallest inch. They don't want to tell us a story. It's, uh, her face or this or where she belongs or what race, no, we don't care. It's this that really points out there. And there you go, your eye may want, but you see, this is not, pointing here at this corner. It's likely before. Here it's sunk. It, it could be leading your eye away, but it's half sunk, so you don't have the whole foot. And all these things are beautifully, then all the thing in the back that gives it movement, and I think it's very, very successful. Shoes from Italy, it's not a brand. It's not a brand, but it is Shoes of Italy, so they want to invoke uh, what Italy is best known for is, of course, music. So you have these soft, rounded uh, uh, masses uh, pointing there, because uh, when you've gone around, your biggest and strongest uh, contrast is between the black of the shoe and the white of the, of the, uh, the paper. Well, this is something else, but uh, again, it's a circle. Uh, you'll, you'll notice that this is not equidistance. Oh, see, see. It's, uh, they could have put it exactly there. They would be uh, less interesting. This leads your eye down, uh, if you, in case you want. Then there's this that cuts in, in case you want it to go out. This goes in and there. Uh, it does not stop. Uh, it, it's equ not equidistant. So then you have, again, this circle is cut off here. And uh, then you go like this, you cannot help it, and you cannot help it, prescript it. That's really uh, irresistible.
At that distance, you maybe don't see it, but there's a tiny, tiny horseman here with a little horse here. Okay, in a magazine, of course, you see it very close, but uh, here. But uh, the color changes a bit here, yes, it does. But it's a very bright orange and uh, simple, simple, but so strong is telling you about the outdoors and how healthy it is to smoke, <laughs> right? You say, did it good to smoke? Yes, the advertising says so. And the little horse, the trade became so small from smoking, see? <laughs> Of course, the head is not complete. That is also one of the elements. It's cut off almost here. It, and there's the, the dark elements here. And uh, this makes your eye go around, this hair. This hair could be flying away, but it's not. It's, it's in here. And the advertising, the letter is here. All these hairs are, because they are cropped, they are repeated. This is not just one snapshot, it's one of a hundred or two hundred. effective this is, but then again, the head of the person is cut away uh, com almost completely. So you have this drop that is seen a mile off, a mile away, and it's an, an advertisement of, uh, of water. I don't like it too much because uh, th this is already a bit washed out, why not? But then if it removes the message, uh, we don't know who, what, where, you know, that's a, and if you have one second to look into it, you're not seeing it. How can I dare even uh, mention uh, that I, but I find, for instance, this, this tangent here, it, had, it draws too much attention. Uh, this is, but maybe it was uh, glazed over, yeah? and it was not seen. And in retouching them, when they get old, then my. But the way it is, my eye goes a lot to that thing. Right? And that's uh, I can I cannot help it. And I think no, um, a man who can do this didn't do that. Uh, glazing is, uh, let's say, uh, oil with uh, some color. Then you like as if it were watercolor, you know. So that you make a veil wherever you want to think push away or so, you make a veil over it and uh, then it would, I'm sure this was less, less important uh, because glazed over and uh, moved back. But it comes forward too much. Otherwise, you see how these disappear and this how beautiful these things, oh, it's a, a beautiful painting, really. Here you have the same thing about composition, how it's not 100%, 50-50, nothing is uh, the same on both sides. It's uh, never the same. And the, all, all the figures are facing in. See how, how they are facing in here. And uh, and, and this uh, subtle uh, ideas about composition. Here, of course, uh, this saint is floating away into the arms of uh, the angels. And uh, I, I really just, Giotto is a great, 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 wonderful painter. Again, see how they are all facing in the middle. To illustrate, the only whole figure here is Judas. I mean, because that's the, uh, the traitor. This will bring the, if it came out, this brings it back in, and all this movement here uh, to uh, accompany the movement here, meaning that was some kind of turmoil. The perfection of the composition is the same thing about how beautifully put together. Huh? Uh, the king and queen are here uh, uh, reflected in the mirror, and I can't remember who he is, this one here. Well, anyway, these are the little princesses, the daughters of the king, and her playmates and all that. But again, you know, facing this way. Even the dog is facing in, you see? And here is Velasquez himself painting. And I said, how come there are no reds at all in this painting? Just, just a thought about composition. So then I said, yes, there are reds. This little boy here, this page, this is a red uh, 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 trousers. Then uh, there is a, these are red, I'm sorry we don't have the details, red ribbons. And the red ribbons. And then I said, why does it go that way? Oh, it's a dot, 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 little parito, little parito, da, 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 da. 
And then there is the palette of himself, of, of Velasquez. Palette here with some reds. And then the message is that if you saw it from close by, you'll see he has a cross, something like being a national artist. It is the, uh, the cross of Calatrava. So the whole painting secretly is talking to us about himself. No? And I, I, it was so, I get goose pimples now, thinking that he was talking to me, and nobody else had noticed it before. Vermeer is a mass, absolute master, like Velasquez, uh, of uh, composition. You cannot imagine what science, what intelligence, what, ah, really, uh, and the proportions and everything. Okay, let's say how this brings your eye in. Really, you cannot help but go this way. This is not a complete triangle or square. It's part of it, so it catches less. Anything you divide, of course, it's obvious that it uh, divided in two, it has half attention. No doubt. So even this, that your eye, you don't have the whole window. You just don't. Everything is cut into uh, small sections so that you'll have the full uh, woman here. Having said what I've said about composition, one day again I was face to face with uh, Goya at the Prado in Madrid and I say, how come he's breaking every damn bit of my uh, theories and everybody else's theories about composition? Because he's facing away, he's facing out, he's half broken, he's out, like everything, you know, just not right. But why? Why, why, why? Because it turns out to be everything is painted very hurriedly, very fast, very, very spontaneously. And there is one detail that is not uh, in the middle of this, because everybody is afraid of, let's say, it's the, the pest or it's, the, uh, it's a danger, it's a terrible danger. Uh, so he represents great danger. All these people are running away except a donkey here. We have a blow up uh, of this donkey here. In the middle of all these uh, people screaming away and running away, in some ways it says that the, if you are ignorant, you cannot see danger. I only have praise for this painting, of course, uh, except, except that this, uh, uh, it breaks uh, some of the things I said, but still, the fact that it's uh, counterbalanced by the emptiness here, etc. Okay, uh, I love it, I love it really. really. Yes, well, this is a very beautiful one, of course, huh? but again, you see how this goes in, in the back. Uh, no, it, they use the same uh, rules as advertising, really, the same, or advertising the same rules as they, uh, they, they use. Uh, uh, all these things are not by chance. It's, everything is very well studied and very well felt. Mr. Sansa is probably one of the foremost uh, expressionist artists. Uh, and what uh, makes his paintings work is that uh, these are really paintings from his own internal uh, soul. His dark period, uh, during uh, his paintings were affected by the war, so, but he was very successful in expressing that. He made no bones about hiding his feelings about that dark period. From the 60s to the early 80s, um, I would describe that as his tranquil period. You know, it, it's, uh, his paintings were uh, calmer, uh, soothing, um, they were very uh, introspective, but you can really feel the tranquility and you can feel the calmness in the paintings. So. From the mid-80s, uh, going further to today, he suddenly found uh, a certain internal peace, an internal joy. So one could describe the third phase of Mr. Sanso as the joyous phase. 
The colors are jumping. They're pumping. They're, they're, they're jumping out at you. The reds, the blues, the oranges, the yellows, you know. And you can, it's almost like it's singing a concerto, a happy concerto. The thing is that people immediately can feel the painting. That's what good, what's good about the Sanso. When you see it, pow, it hits you. Whether it's that dark period, tranquil period, or the joyous period, immediately you get a feeling. And those are the paintings that are fantastic paintings. Drawing, I do less of it, and uh, because I've done so much of it already that uh, I feel surer of what I'm doing now after a good 50 years of drawing, and really drawing like uh, like crazy, and I do it once in a while. I really do. My father wanted me to learn how to draw for the family business. And he didn't know he was making the biggest mistake in his life. In our father's business, in my father's business, we had some vases that were painted on for the stands, iron stands, and, uh, with a more sort of like uh, views uh, on each side. And one Sunday I went there, I thought I would be continuing the paintings, and I made such a mess that everybody knew I <laughs> sneaked in and painted. <laughs> a medium. Well, uh, there was pencil, uh, yes, pencil. And then we didn't have ball pens and these things that are easy to handle. But I remember now, there was a hardware store that was a mall for us at that period. It was a smaller thing. In American, it was Parsons Hardware, I remember. And uh, my father's business bought a lot from them. And in, for Christmas, um, they had gifts for the family. And they had me and my sister to, to select something. And I selected was a painting box with uh, all kinds of colors and things. You know, I was so overwhelmed I never used it. I still didn't have a technique to uh, interpret things. Uh, it was copying uh, photographs and copying this and that, because uh, they say children are geniuses and this and that. Well, up to a certain point, but uh, <clears throat> the fact is they, do, they really construct the painting very badly, or uh, it's really a smashing uh, statement, but not really more. Well, uh, a grown-up person, of course, if he's good at the composition, he's on the right road. <laughs> the war started when I was 11, so Let's imagine, by the, then on we all had to work because we were, uh, everything was taken away from us by the Japanese. <clears throat> and what, what could we do? Uh, we planted kamote up in Montalban, uh, everything was taken away. So we were extremely poor, we were extremely poor. So what things do we have to draw with? It started with this gentleman who came to our house. Uh, that was very shortly after liberation. Uh, business was starting again. And he wanted to, uh, he ho hoped to sell some of the, uh, not pseudo Amor Solo, but in the school of Amor Solo. And father didn't like him too much and said, no, but would he be kind enough to teach me how to draw? That's how it started. One of the big
big problems with uh, people who don't know about uh, composition is precisely to compose. Okay, so it's notes thrown in. Imagine a composer just throwing in notes without a composition. The idea that if you learn technique, you have to be a slave of it is ridiculous. You're a slave of it if you have nothing to say, okay? So, you have nothing to say, whether it's abstract or it's not abstract, you have nothing to say. Because you should be doing something else. Maybe you're a marvelous accountant or a marvelous uh, <laughs> a fireman or, you know, a bombero. <laughs> Pen and ink is a bit more difficult than charcoal. It is, uh, it's more difficult to handle, definitely. But um, what has influenced me along the, uh, what we call dry brush, we'll have some examples here of dry brush painting, is very much inspired by the Chinese or Japanese paintings, definitely. Michelangelo, Da Vinci, Velasquez, Goya, Degas, Toulouse-Lautrec, Van Gogh. Uh, Gogh and the drawings are fabulous, fabulous. So uh, don't give me the baloney that you can just smash around and uh, you, you know how to draw. No, you, you don't. I was of a generation that had gone through the war, and we could not pretend that life was beautiful lavanderas and beautiful rice fields and all that. It was no longer there for us, for us. I must go back to my teacher, who was kind enough, Mr. Celis was so kind, Alejandro Celis, was so kind that he said one day after months of uh, lessons with him uh, that I should go to the School of Fine Arts because he could not teach me more there alone and I, I, it's good to be with other people of my own age and then uh, with professors like uh, the ones we had in UP. We were the first batch who transferred to Diliman in 1949. So you would say uh, we were victims, all victims of the war. He would come as early as the janitor, even earlier sometimes. And then he would paint before classes. And in the late afternoon, he would stay until the building was locked for the night. Even during our lunch breaks, for example, he would be uh, col uh, what is this, experimenting on uh, colors, and then we would, we would tease him because he would be scratching and scratching, which is what he's doing until today. Because he's dedicated to his painting, you could see that he concentrate on his work. He never uh, stopped until he finished his painting. That is just a student, no? He was the mimic of the class. Huh? He made us laugh. He was jolly, but he was very serious when he started to, you know, when he paints. He really was very conscientious in his painting. He was not very good in the beginning. <laughs> and his eyeglass were this thick. But to show you his love for art. Magkasama kami niyan eh. Uh, we would stay over time. All the students have gone home, and most of the time, kami dalawa lang. Maybe because we felt we were not very good. So, ang sipag namin. We tried and tried, no matter how unsuccessful our works were. We tried and tried. He would make you know, the piece of paper, and then little squares of different colors, and then he would be, while, we're, while he's talking, because he was always talking, we'd be scratching and scratching, and it's, a, it's the, the birth of his art. He has the drive 
and the intensity. He has both the industry and possibly even at that time vision. I'm glad that the, the president gave him a, an award, you know, and uh, it's a good uh, reaction to the young painters that they are being thought of and that they are uh, being taken care of by, uh, by our uh, president so that uh, people will continuously patronize the Filipino painters. Although he's a foreigner by citizenship, I think, he's still a Filipino painter. His works are really good and uh, they really, um, at least here, they appreciate his work is very much. I like his colors and I like the strong lines that he puts into it and uh, I like him as a person. <laughs> I respect him very much. I hold him with high regard for his integrity as an artist. Uh, he's also very hardworking and he came upon uh, the stage where he is now due to hard work. Not many collectors know about drawings. Uh, they stay away from them, I don't know why, because maybe they don't know how difficult and how revealing it is of an artist. At least for those who know drawing and who are used to this type of thing, will uh, see that it is a drawing that is already uh, done by someone who's been drawing for at least 10, 20 years, because this is a freehand thing with no previous drawing at all, and it's a direct thing. So we call this dry brush painting, much, much inspired, I think, by the Chinese ink paintings. So this is quite hard to master. And of course, at each period, I've changed subjects and technique uh, because I was a different person every 10 years. Like we all do change uh, every five, six, seven, eight years. We are a different person with different experiences. So this was true then. Drawing has that wonderful thing in it that reveals, uh, how can I say, uh, maybe a solo violin or a solo uh, dancer. You know, you, you cannot be fooling around uh, pretending. It is there with no adornments, uh, with no adornments. So I've used drawings in many, many, many ways. I, I've done really thousands of drawings and so, um, some of them, I've, although I never throw anything away because not that I think they are have any value uh, money-wise, but because then I learn how to uh, not make the same mistakes uh, too often. This was in Binondo. So imagine uh, how Binondo was. Oh, this is an estero, and this is the toilet, uh, uh, the tubo going up. This was the toilet. Uh, <laughs> this was uh, not from uh, nature. This was imagined, okay, it's imaginary. But uh, these were really on the spot. Well, you see, this is Brittany, this is New York, this is Mexico. Uh, so it gives. This is Italy. So you see how I've pursued drawing through through my uh, throughout my life. And now these are all freehand, no previous drawing. And to do perspective like this freehand is crazy. With a brush, it's crazy, absolutely crazy. Well, I went crazy, so that's why I am the way I am, so. Drawing was not terribly respected at that period, uh, really not. Uh, you know, it was something to get you going on to better or stronger things. Uh, we had to have it, it was part of every day we had our uh, uh, classes of that. But generally it was color and uh, paint and this and that. So drawing was something very personal.
And I was looking for something that I could really find a, a new challenge. Let's put it that way, a new challenge. And of course, the opposite, the absolute opposite was etching. on a plate, a uh, copper plate. Then, while you are working on the copper plate, the idea is, if you have, um, you, you put your uh, plate, your copper plate, in acid for it to be actually, it's called bitten, it's biting. It is, even the name of etching comes from German, that means biting in Danish, I think it says. Uh, etching comes from that, the fact that you're going to put that and it's your controlling how deep or how much or where the acid is going to attack. Why did I go that way? It, I, I think really, truly, it was this reaction and, and it was directly connected with my drawing because it's very, very graphic. Well, it's one of the graphic arts in any case. So I started with um, thinking that, well, it would be some just novelty, and then it got, I got passionately involved and really just went on for about five years. Crazy, 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 because materially, as much as fresco, or even more so than fresco, there's, there's very little market for it. I started the, the etching and I passionately fell in love with it and uh, on and on and on and on. And then what do I get? I get this thing of uh, the print of the year for uh, the uh, uh, Cleveland Museum of Art, which is one of the greatest museums in the world. Really is, really is, really is. And the uh, Far Eastern collection is one of the best in the world. <laughs> happiest moments in my life was the whole thing was really with excellent people working there and then the, and the curators buy my stuff for themselves you know I mean I never mind I respect critics but that to me was the top accolade really just absolutely marvelous so the relationship was very good and even the sales uh, they were not generally selling there but uh, well uh, I had very beautiful sales and things continued from then on I had the first one-man show of prints in Philippine art history at, in 1957, and that was at the uh, RC, uh, Philippine Art Gallery, PAG, yes. Okay, I did this exhibition and they would be angry to see the same work they thought that I was copying myself and selling. It's a multiple, it is a multiple, but each of the pieces are an original. Then how is that possible? And I couldn't find an answer, and a very clear one eventually uh, came to my mind, is your fingerprint will always be an original. Always. Forever, even if you're dead, they can still, okay, okay. That means that you can have multiples and still be original, because I did the, uh, the, the plate, 100%. So it's my work. Well, this print was for me the joy of my life in the world of prints because everything went so well and it opened so many doors and so many collections and so many museums and really it was. And what really pleased the public, the museum people, and what really got me uh, all, all uh, happy doing it is the, the, the rhythms within the rhythms, you know, the, the point counterpoint, which made it, of course, each thing had an answer somewhere or a contradiction, whatever. And in any case, yes. So this is etching, mm, this is etching. All these are etching. 
So uh, th this belongs to the museum of uh, the Cleveland Museum. This one was ordered by the International Graphic Arts Society of New York. And uh, that too was very popular. They said very electric, uh, that, that way, almost like a lightning. If you don't get it right the first time, all you do is wipe the, with the gasoline, the varnish, and then you start again till you get it right. That's what I loved about it. Because it liberated me from an idea that one had to paint only with brushes. And uh, well, you can paint with any damn thing that comes along that pleases you, that you should do, I think. Well, at least I do. So from very academic uh, approaches, uh, I ended up with my own way because I had a big problem with the uh, seniors in the School of Fine Arts in Paris because they resented my freedom. This is the first stage, as I was explaining. You make uh, stages because you draw in, you, know, uh, you scratch the plate off with, with a needle, sort of, and it's like drawing. Uh, I could have left it this way, but I wanted to go further and give it more relief, uh, all these movements of uh, someone sending, uh, selling apples, and I called it Eve. Uh, she was tempting the passerby. Here is another technique, which is, uh, what do they call it, a stencil making a stencil with uh, uh, a varnish that is called uh, soft, uh, soft ground varnish. Instead of, because this takes endless time to do it one by little, one little, 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 little. it would take too long. So you make a cutout, then you put your varnish in there, and then of course you have to work on it and make it look fluffy and make it look, uh, well, uh, make it look like a cat. Or, so this was for the Associated American Artists in, in New York. This, you see how you can start very, 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 very confused. I knew what I wanted more or less, of course. And this is the first state and this is how it ended as a lobster. It ended up as a lobster, you see how, how it goes. I had to, of course, push back, push back the background so that this will come out. So the professor, one day he said, I'd like to see you do a flower. I said, oh, wow, oh, a flower. He said, yes, yes, just do it your own way. So I tried it, and then I've not stopped doing flowers ever again. I mean, I've, I've, I've continued doing flowers and then doing flowers and doing flowers, yes. So off we go. And this is my first flower in print. A chrysanthemum. Uh, this is a uh, what would you call a, a shipwreck? Uh, shipwrecked. Uh, just we had so many during the Japanese occupation, uh, the liberation particularly. Yes. So the technique would be too involved. What is interesting here, for those who don't realize how varied the techniques are here, is this is scotch tape that is stuck onto the plate for the acid not to penetrate, and then. Uh, worked uh, on it. This, uh, the idea here is all these big sweeping uh, rhythms here, straight, 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 and these that are counteracting that, and this pointing in to the boat. No, no, yes. uh, there was a danger that the eye would go out, out, so that I have these things to stop the eye and get it back uh, circulating within the, the etching. I think it was in uh 1963 or 64, that was at the Luce Gallery, and uh, these were black and white etchings. And uh, when I saw the um, my first prints, few prints, I was uh, flabbergasted. I was uh, I was moved because this was uh, so emotional. His prints, it's like uh, nothing I've seen before. It was the quality of the uh, the lines. They were not perfect, and the uh, the uh, subject matter were those that are uh, really uh, uh, depressing, and yet so beautiful. You know, shanties, uh, the uh, bamboos, the roots, decaying things. You know, fat women. So it's really amazing. It was one of the first expressionists I ever encountered. It's not just uh, uh, his uh, drawing style. 
It was the message that he was uh, communicating or expressing. It was, this is uh, not just any ordinary drawing by his, some artist. He was making uh, his, his, uh, his art or his message uh, uh, higher than others. His, uh, his vision is a cut above the rest. In Sanso's art, you really see the details. Uh, Juvenal Sanso is the kind of guy that once he puts himself into a particular type of art, he would really experiment and exhaust all means and modes and methods to achieve the best out of it. And you can really see and examine the detail in every particular work of art that he will ever do. Etching have rewarded me the most in international exposure. Uh, the museums, the great collectors and all this came because I was offering something that nobody had or, uh, or very few artists were devoting their time to that. So it's one of the things I tell the young, because kind enough to ask me if there's a formula to be successful. And I say, well, don't do it my way because it's, it's very hard. I've always dared to what I needed more than what I wanted. In any case, my professor, after I'd gone through uh, painting, the usual painting thing which I got to, to not dislike but tired of, then I went to fresco painting, the, there were no flowers there. And then to prints, imagine in black and white, uh, I wasn't thinking of flowers. So he liked my works and said, yes, you can uh, work with me in my atelier in the school of, within the School of Fine Arts. So one day he says, yes, you, you do these things very well, the dramatic things. I would like you do me a flower. I said, a flower? Yeah, you know, no, no. <laughs> he said, yes, yes, do it your own way. Do it your own way. So I did, and I've not stopped doing flowers from then on. Flowers were, I found a bit, uh, what would you say, a, a bit too freely, a bit too sweet, a bit too this, a bit too that, thinking it would always be glioli and, and you know, and a vase and, I, I, okay, it turns out to be flowers can be as sexy and fleshy and uh, that, everything else. Oh, okay. So when you think of them as reproductive uh, organs, then you've got it all made, you know? <laughs> It's the artistic side that interests me more than botanical facts. Okay, maybe they are not really true to, to nature, but it is, uh, I have studied what can be called, because when you uh, draw so much, then what you understand is the, let's call it architecture, that holds a flower up, uh, the leaves up, Well, we were talking about flowers and how different it can be along the way. Okay, so technically, of course, this was based, ah, a very important step 
was I discovered it when doing an exhibition I had of 1,000 works, a retrospective. So then I had to see things next to and the chronology. Then I realized that this substituted for all the grotesque faces. Because it's a head, but florally ex uh, expressed. I'm so absolutely uh, fascinated and uh, really in love with color. I've gone slowly into it because my first paintings were quite dark, uh, a result of all the uh, trauma of the war. And uh, it shows in the subjects, of course. And then slowly, but very slowly, got into color. And now I'm crazy about it, crazy. So this is uh, an interesting, in, in four examples, very different ways of uh, feeling, feeling uh, vegetation, feeling plants, and all that, 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 with dominant blue in, as a background, and then these red spots here that are flowers, and then the green. Well, generally they're about uh, primary colors now, and I enjoy having them clashing together. So the obvious joy of flowers is color in general, but basically you've got all this in black and white too. The architecture, the movement, all this, that it can be Baroque in so many ways, and I think my vegetation is very Baroque. So there's this freedom, yet, yet within uh, a square, within it just doesn't fly off the handle. So uh, the more I do flowers, the more I feel this uh, freedom, yet restrained freedom. Oh, the moon, of course. There is the question of the moon, very often asked. Um, uh, just one little answer would be too short, but the moon allows me three or four things. One is a hypnotic center, because this is so busy, and uh, I, I need it, really need it. I need a quiet. And also, it gives you, if you see the moon, it means that the sky is clear, okay? And also, it gives you scale, it gives you distance, and it gives you a, a what, what do you call it, a, a, a silent point there, like that. if you are looking closely at the flora, you will never see such kind of flora in the Philippines. So it must have been a flower of his imagination, or a flower that had a reference in actuality, but actually was funneled through his creative uh, process and came out looking not as any kind of flower anymore, but a flower by Sanso. And uh, so we have the series work, let us say, of the coral, like this one, underwater corals. And then uh, there is the phase that he will uh, do one by one. He individually, then he takes it out. So his stroke are really these particular phases, the way he does the coral, the way he does the landscape, his architectural form. and. Yeah, this kind of spongy and linear and crosswise, I think that was uh, that what he has, that is very individual. Let's face it, uh, sometimes uh, Juby can get engrossed in flowers, he can get engrossed in subjects that seem to forever be there, but I can see his point. The point that I see there is every time that he finishes a Brittany landscape, he asks himself, is this the best I can do of this Brittany landscape that I see? So he tries another version. So he does a flower painting 
And also the same question applies. Is this the best flower painting that I can do? So he keeps on doing it. It's not, dogma, it's not so much that he's repeating himself, but he just keeps on asking himself, is this the best I can do? All kinds of flowers, standing, sitting, round, you name it. Uh, every possible, I won't say trick, but uh, vision of flowers has uh, followed me all over for, for at least 25, 30 years. It's still going on, stronger and stronger. You know, what I really love about uh, the works of uh, uh, Mr. Sanso is the great uh, reverential love for, for nature. His use of color and tone distinguishes him from other artists. He is able to create atmosphere and mood in his landscapes. It's nature really that impels him to do this, um, you know, fantastic uh, imaginary landscapes, actually. Sanso's avid reading in literature and philosophy becomes obvious whenever I converse with him lengthily. He claims, and I like to think his claim valid, that his background in world literature and philosophy deepens and infuses larger meaning into his paintings. For the war, it was a picnicking ground. We loved the place, and it was really at that period just pure waters. We could almost drink from the, from the we used to swim, and uh, lovely, just beautiful, beautiful days. So later on, it was a place of uh, getting away from the war as much as we could. And what can I say more about that fact that uh, the landscapes, the rocks were, also, I found out uh, many years after the Montalban that there was an older uh, reason for loving rocks. Is uh, friends of ours uh, who, were in, uh, who lived in France, uh, friends of ours in Spain when I was a baby, um, there was a civil war in Spain, so they were, went as refugees to France and stayed on. Well, in any case, they had pictures of us, of all, the whole group, and we were in, in a river just like Montalban. I mean white rocks and everything like Montalban except the vegetation of course which is uh, not tropical. So I have a picture very blurry of um, father, mother, sister and myself sitting on rocks, standing on rocks and people all over the place, friends. Okay. So there was something already in the subconscious if we may or uh, an, an imprint of all these things that come and waken up uh, and awaken and well they start there from that spark and it goes on. Later on, you recognize yourself without knowing it. Montalban was a place, as later on, it was in Brittany. Brittany was very significant because of a very lasting, wonderful friendship besides. So for about 23, 24 years, I went every summer to the house of Yves Le Dantec, of whom I must speak because he's a pillar in my background, knowing French, because one of the things I asked him, don't think I'm charming that I make mistakes. I don't want to make mistakes. Uh, I said, you, uh, please 
Just be kind enough to correct me each and every time I make a mistake. In the middle of a conversation, say, no this, yes, 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 no, 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 no. So he did it for years and years. And well, my French became more or less uh, the level of my English. So that took some doing, uh, because I said, <laughs> French was my sixth language. So we used to go even the boulevard, or I paint, we painted everything around. They burnt out high alive. We went to uh, San Beda in Intramuros and the walls. Oh, the cathedral. Oh, we did a lot of these things. Manila burnt out. We tried to get, find beauty and all that, but <laughs> it was what it was. So then Diliman was a different sort of thing because you had the plain of uh, Marikina and uh, well, we did a lot of uh, views there. Tagaytay, we did some Tagaytay bits also and uh, what else? We tried Baguio, watercolors in Baguio. Uh, with Harry, with uh, Jonsson, with uh, Gat, the cartoonist, and uh, we were four, Jonsson ah, and Malang. See, the seascapes came with Brittany. Yeah. Because we don't have what uh, Brittany has, is the tides may vary, I mean, from the lowest to the highest tide, something like 12 meters. Can you imagine what it is, 12 meters? Huh? So you're standing here, terra firma, and it happened to me at least once, is then I forgot. So I was painting what I was seeing, this and that, and all of a sudden I was on an island. Well, uh, this is a perfect example of my mixture of what later became, of course, with the basis I had of Brittany and much of it, that uh, then I mixed it with Matabunkai and I started mixing up things else. Well, in any case, this could be the Batangas uh, area, very easily the sea and the rocks too. And, but also, those who know Brittany see Brittany, and those who know the Philippines see the Philippines. And I see both at the same time. So then you have here uh, studies of waves, the wave patterns, because as I said a while ago, is you may be standing here thinking you are on uh, solid earth, and all of a sudden the sea goes up so high that you may be just absolutely uh, close to floating. So you have these studies of waves, which of course uh, you could easily convert it into plants if you wish. That is why many of my paintings are started uh, you know, an abstract way, because what I'm doing is finding my rhythms, my spaces, my composition, then the subject matter comes after, generally. Sometimes I do intend to do a place, but generally now I've done it enough for me to just let go and just really explode myself uh, painting it and having a grand time with it. So uh, here's an example of, in this case, the balance tips over to the Filipino. Uh, <laughs> because you have all these uh, uh, baklad things, and uh, oh, the Britain, Breton side is, uh, the, the Bretons would say, yeah, but we, where do we have this on the coast? Uh, and for the Filipino, it's immediately uh, bamboos, and uh, oh, you can have it in Laguna, Laguna de Bay, and uh, definitely. So it's so all this, uh, of course, it, it's difficult to put a cent very centralized thing, it is because, but I hope uh, my intentions were to do it and yet not fall prey of this centrality. So I hope I did it right. Anyway, you have these, fa uh, what do you call these, big rhythms like this, and then to show the uh, receding planes, 
Then the, oh, here are their big bulky ones. Then as they go, they become slower, lower rhythms as you go farther away, farther away until you almost don't, it's, they, you cannot perceive, you cannot feel the, the horizon. It's so uh, intermixed with uh, the sky. And then, uh, no. This is about, you can say the same thing, these very strong uh, rhythms here. Uh, and then as you go along, then you slow down with, uh, that's something important in, in any, any composition, is your rhythms. Here in Mega Mall, before it opened or when it opened, Mr. Hansi asked me to organize a show for for Senso, and it was put in. A, we had a show in one of the units in Building B, second floor. But it was so successful, and that started the art walk because it was so successful. So they invited the galleries to come in here. Sanso has a big demand, so um, he's uh, in, in terms of the market, like a, he's a blue chip. So um, I, I would recommend that uh, you know, if you're a starting collector or an old collector, to buy a Sanso for the simple reason that he is bankable and and and, and good, no, and good. Well, the simplicity, the masterful strokes, and of course the colors, no? people get attracted to his colors. Um, well, you could see the mastery, the simplicity, uh, the poetry dun sa, sa strokes. I would like the, to carry the, the fast moving, meaning the, you know, the corals, the flowers, um, because those are the easy to move or the easy to understand and so But if you will uh, look back, uh, uh, during the 50s and 60s, which is the height of uh, Sanso's, uh, well, that was his prime, when he was still a student, and uh, the, the, the figurative is the, are, are the rare Sanso's. Those are the collectible, from the point of view of a collector. Well, in terms of uh, business, no, he's very professional when it comes to dealing with, with galleries. So that's the thing that I admired with Sanso. When I entered the, the houses of uh, old collectors, especially the, 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 the collectors of before, not, not the new wave collectors now, no? Uh, it is the figurative of Sanso, which he is not doing it, uh, uh, well, unfortunately, not, not anymore, no? As an artist, he's tireless, he's very determined, you know, he's very serious about his, his art and he's very consistent. You know, kahit na, there's a lot of Sanso works, I mean, really a lot, because he, he non-stop painting child, but each one is good. I mean, very, very consistent. If he was a Filipino citizen, or uh, he would uh, have been a national artist now, or, or proclaimed national artist, because he, he is uh, sincere in, in, his, uh, in his work. Once upon a time, the Sansos owned a large piece of property uh, in Makati, and they had a whole block that they were trying to sell. And at that moment, the Philippine Daily Inquirer was looking for a property. And when I saw this, I thought this might be perfect for the Inquirer. So we bought the land 
from Sanso Pedret's family. And uh, that is where the Philippine Daily Inquirer is sitting on now. So when I bought the property for the Inquirer, I said, I need a souvenir about Sanso. So I saw that he was selling some paintings and I saw this particular one and I loved it and I said, okay, we will, I'll buy this. Oh, I have the greatest admiration for him because I think of him not just a Filipino artist or an artist from the Philippines, but he's really an international artist. And I think I appreciated that when I lived in Europe and I saw how he, he is um, recognized by the top museums in France, in Spain, and even his vision and his way of looking at things is not parochial at all, but very international. Um, I buy my painting by gut feeling. When I look at a painting, I know I like it and then I'll buy it, no matter what style it is. And the style of Pachan Soyo appeals to me. In one of my visits to Luz Gallery, uh, that time Luz Gallery was in EDSA. Okay. Uh, while I was looking at the drawers, I saw this particular painting. I didn't even know it was a Sanso. And it was a great painting. Uh, it was a seascape, and you can see that the, the waves, the rush of waters, you can see it rushing against the big rocks. And I could feel it, and I was really in love with it. And then I saw it was a Sanso, and the price was right. It was 900 this was in 1980 or 81, and wow, it fits my pocket. So I immediately purchased it. Uh, I think uh, months after when I acquired a book on Sanso by Ding Roses, I saw that it was occupying one page. In the same way that we have dual citizenship, I suppose uh, he uh, can honestly be considered both a Filipino artist as well as an international artist. He's been exhibited all over the world, which is uh, excellent. What do I like about it? Well, you know, all his paintings, there's always a moon, so that you see a moon there. And also, uh, but what I like most are these uh, clouds of foliage that he has. It's very interesting and uh, not many people seem to know how to do it and he does it so well. That's why I like this painting. What attracted me are the colors also and the strokes, different kind of strokes. And up till this day, see I got this painting, I never sold it. I, up to this day, I am, I am keeping it and it's, in, it's one of my precious jewels. I'm looking forward to owning an, uh, another Sanso, which is different from this, because I've been seeing a lot of um, series that's different from this also. So I will be looking for an opportunity to buy another one. I mean, his works uh, won't fall apart. Uh unlike uh, quite possibly some others who are less of craftsmen, his uh, imagination, which is uh, born out of uh, his international uh, exposure, his uh, willingness to uh, learn and uh, to strike out in new directions. These are, uh, I think, uh, things that artists can learn from uh, Sanso. I think uh, <clears throat> the human suffering we had during the Japanese uh, 
had to be expressed by somebody, not flowers, not, not, not shoes, not landscapes, not, you know, well, of course you can also, but there's something about the human being, being ourselves, that are really are closest to, to what we are. Even in the School of Fine Arts, I was straying away or moving out of that orbit. I was orbiting out, but with the approval of the professors. <laughs> My heart is with the tradition of this, and still is, but that doesn't step, stop one from learning from the others. Okay, the one thing I've learned, I hope, well enough, is composition to start with. Not the anecdote, but the composition. The anecdote comes, or then they work together from the very beginning, but you need composition. <laughs> Solo approved because I was painting in his class, and one day he was behind me, and I didn't realize because he was a very shy man, about, about five or ten meters away. And I turned around, and there he was, and he said, "Good, good, good." Then we had an American exchange professor by the name of Cyril Nutley. Imagine I remember his name. Well, anyway, Cyril Nutley, who came and saw the whole class, he was uh, an exchange professor, uh, and he said that I was painting the same model, but on a higher plane. I thought it was marvelous. I, th I was just a student. I was a teenager. And so I presented it, and uh, a friend called me. Uh, Gadmonton, the uh, caricaturist, who was a good friend, said, Oi! Tumakbo ka dyan, dito, at Northern Motors in uh, Port Area. Nanalo ka. I thought I would get a chocolate uh, medal of sorts. And at the door, I meet uh, Anita Magsaysay Ho, who comes and congratulates me at the door. And I was so flustered, I didn't know what was happening. And she said, you know, I admire your works very much. And I said, me too. Meaning, I need to, you're, but I was so shy, and I still am shy, you know, don't tell anybody. So I, I, I told her, and for years I would blush, I'm blushing now, uh, to think that I've made a fool of myself. <laughs> a few months later, within, I don't know, 10 months or something, there was again a national. Uh, contest of uh, Art Association of the Philippines. I can imagine again, I won first prize, which was already something rather, rather exceptional. And uh, this was uh, a watercolor. It's a gouache actually, but it's, it's a watercolor. So uh, then what this did to me was monumental because then my parents allowed me to go and study abroad. Purita's daughter, Ada, a very good friend too, uh, told me something I, I did not know at all uh, till then. Uh, this is about a year ago or something. She said, you know, your mother called my mother and she asked, do you think our son has talent enough to go abroad? And she said, yet yeah, very much. So uh, nobody told me that. They said, okay, you go, but for one year, well, I've been in Paris for about 50 years. You know? <laughs> Every year was last year, last year, last year, last year, last year, yes. I love portraiture very much, very, very much, but unfortunately we are all so vain, including myself, that um, then it, it becomes, like I think it was uh, Sargent, who was a great portraitist, said, Every time I paint a portrait, I lose a friend, you know? People want to look uh, a million years younger. These also were really models in the School of Fine Arts. Uh, of course, there was already this 
to us dating uh, the head half out of the picture, imagine. Uh, under uh, But anyway, uh, I wasn't kicked out of the school. Uh, this is my sister and this is my mother. And they were so bored posing that they are both reading, okay? <laughs> they, really, it looks like them very much, uh, my sister. It's like a charcoal, uh, charcoal drawing, yes. No, it's just very, very simple, very uh, family, in family. I don't know, even know where it is. This, you know. I was starting to sign Juvenal instead of Sanso, you know. There's a J here, but I never finished the, the signature itself. I'm sorry, I tell them from the very beginning, if I sign the painting, the portrait, you'll have to take it, okay? It's my responsibility, but the, our contract is that they say yes, yes, but they don't believe it. Uh, uh, I said, at least one third of the portrait is the painter himself. He cannot escape that. He cannot escape that, and well, you accept that or you don't. So, uh, so one day I said, no more portraits, not for money, not, well, for friends, yes, but no, not for money. So I gave up, there was lots of money there. Again, I dared not, not follow that, uh, because trail, you know, making rosy pink, or uh, I don't know what, or wala nang kulubot na. So, uh, still life, I've danced from the very beginning, of course. This was the obvious answer to having a nude model. It was uh, uh, going out with your paint box, feeling stupid in the streets, and uh, people looking over your shoulder, uh, you know, okay. So, uh, it's the obvious answer. Where do we place uh, still lives? The, the flowers are still lives. My bicycle drawings are uh, still life. You know, some dolls, yes, those are still lives. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to say where one starts and the other ends. And uh, well, it's a question of, well, it's a, a quarrel of words. And maybe it's still life after all. But I think still life is not really of, well, yes. Uh, Flowers that are alive, why not? Why not the still life, yes. But it's more inanimate, I think, still life. Well, the word means it. Yes, yes, and now that I think of it, the word implies uh, still life, okay. Uh, but flora, flowers, vegetation, uh, all these things uh, are about growth. Among the things I've done in the past, of course, is the, uh, this uh, typewriter. And uh, uh, <laughs> it was a rundown typewriter I was using for my thesis in Rome. Uh, it was rented, actually, uh, and I had so very little money uh, with my $150 a month pension from the house uh, allowed by Central Bank. Uh, but they had this old, well, it worked, but it was just run down, the poor thing. It, uh, they were, used to have rentals and things like that in, in Rome, in Europe. So, um, uh, no, nothing very special except it's painted like a portrait. The same technique, the same approach. Yes, uh, here, of course, it's the, the circles within the circles, within the circles, within the circles. Everything is expressed in circles, okay? So, you have a central point of light which of course I placed to have that. So it's not just by chance, but even there, there was something shining on it. It is a uh, storm lamp, I think used by uh, min miners, I think it was. So uh, there it is, uh, a classroom work in Rome with, again, uh, the, 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 uh, we play around with these circles and the slow circles and the fast circles and the slower and this, all this is always, and then the, the very rigid 
to contrast the very mellow, uh, twelving um, shapes of the, of the silhouette, and also this very sharp table in the back. So this was in the School of Fine Arts. I quote myself here, okay. Uh, my professor was such a neurotic that he had me repeat this play a hundred times just to make the lines and the roundness of the object alike on both sides. I would say this pers his persistence on the perfection of this plate has uh, influenced me in refining the other ac academic works. Wow. <laughs> well, he was so, uh, he was a very difficult man, very difficult man. Well, theater came to me, I didn't go, to, of course I went to theater, but theater came to me because one of the great specialists, uh, an Italian, I had a show in Rome, and he came and he saw my barong barons and all the baclades. <coughs> he said, these lighting effects that come from you, uh, he said, you're made for the theater. I said, oh yeah, sure, oh wow, uh, now. He said, don't think I'm, I'm just being a polite. He says, when you go back to Paris, go see, and she mentioned to, uh, the name of, to me, uh, to me it was one of the goddesses, in, in, uh, one of the gods in, in theater, and it was uh, Lila de Nobidi. So I went to see her and she said, you are made for the theater. And, she said, and I said, well, you know, um, uh, not, uh, I was shy about it because I didn't know a damn thing about it. And she said, it's, I'm so serious that please call Mr. Gabriel de Chouge, the artistic director of the two operas in Paris, uh, uh, Opéra Comique and the, uh, the main one, and also the creator, the director, and the, uh, the uh, let's say, the, the magician of, uh, for Mozart, in Aix-en-Provence. Uh, Dussouge liked my work so much, he said, you are, because Lila de Noveli had said, you are made for the production coming up, which is Wozzeck. You are made for Wozzeck. You go see him and uh, she phoned him. And, uh, so I went to see him, he said, you are made for the theater. You are made for Wozzeck. The theater, I generally painted or drew my costumes on black paper because it's closer to the ambiance of a stage, right? And instead of white paper, that the colors really, and then you get your colors right. So, Toulouse Opera heard about me, and a friend introduced me to the director, and they make me uh, do the sets and costumes for um, The Gambler, uh, Prokofiev uh, music on Dostoevsky's masterpiece, after all. It's a great success, but I always think that theater is both heaven, when you're sitting down there and having nothing to do, and it's hell backstage. It is, can be, an opera is the worst possible thing. It really is the worst possible thing because uh, human talent is pushed to its extreme.
when I worked with Giancarlo Menotti, it was the opposite. With Giancarlo Menotti, it was, I mean, really heaven with him. We, we uh, interacted, of course, which is natural. And uh, he was not saying anymore anything about my sets, my costumes, right? and I thought he didn't like them. And then one day, my assistant, who, by the way, is a niece of uh, Gian uh, Cellini, the uh, movie director, yes, uh, Fiorella Rossellini, I think it was her name, said, no, if he, it was a button out of place, he would tell you. In any case, uh, with Menotti, a few minutes before, uh, 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 opening the sea, I mean, uh, uh, just on, uh, curtain rising, is that the word? Yes. Um, I went and said, Giancarlo, please, uh, is, why is it, uh, I mean, uh, you don't like it? He uh, uh, says, what, are you f uh, fishing for compliments? It's perfect, it's perfect, ah, be happy, it's perfect. Oh, you know, <laughs> I couldn't believe my luck. <laughs> These things do move, everything moves, opens up, so that First you have it here, and then even the lights here, the ca huge candles, there are three uh, planes of, uh, and the lights of course flicker uh, as candles. Uh, I found a way uh, to have them flicker. So finally everything is open, see how it opens here. And then here are the, let's say, the, um, we call them Protestants, if, we, if you wish, uh, who are burnt alive. Her lover is burnt alive, then say so uh, is burnt alive, and uh, so he is the power, the reigning power, etc., etc. He was all in reds and gold, and it was, well, it was very successful. I did one for uh, Daisy Avidana, okay, uh, uh, Tatarin. I did the, the, the sets for them, and uh, well, uh, that was before uh, Mion. That was Mion. But I've never, I've not seen the, the, the play. I've not seen also, why well, Mion Esso? Yes, Mion Esso. We needed a design for Mion, a set design, and I wasn't satisfied with the, the designs I saw. I needed something modern, but something representative, but you know, anyway, I wasn't satisfied. There is a painting on my wall, which is right there, and that was my inspiration. This is the one, that's what I want. I want this kind of a set. And it was almost this kind of a set. Can you see the church here? Can you see the bamboo? Can you see this going out this way? Most people, uh, you see painting, you already know the, the, the subject or the idea. With Sanso, it's like, yes, I see the painting, then I have to see beneath the painting, and then beyond the painting. So it's like, you can stare for it, you know, for like an hour and still try to figure out what is going on, and, but you don't feel heavy. That, I think, is a, the, the turning point for his painting. <laughs> but back then, it wasn't easy. No, no, it's, it's, no it's, oh, you were asking about how I survived. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've always been a very, uh, I always do experiment 
all the time about mm -hmm. uh, you using this, using that, always, always. I'm never happy with just, I know already. I don't know already. Mm -hmm. I must know more. I think it would be a challenge for Sanzo to draw simple lines. I, I really believe, because he's such a master of you know, using complicated lines and detail to, to create, a, create a vision or, or a visual. I don't know if he would actually survive just being, being told you can only draw no more than 20 lines. I think that would drive him insane, <laughs> but it would be a challenge for Senso. Uh, I didn't think either that they would be cutting, that the central bank would be cutting off our 100, measly $150 per month for everything, okay? So imagine living in Europe, at that, even at that period, with $150. To me, it was okay, but sometime later, maybe a year or two after, all of a sudden, the central bank cut off even the $150. They said, for students to go back, period. Mm -hmm. Go back to Manila, period. So do I go back? I mean, a beaten dog, not, not because I, there's so much I wanted to know, and I still want to know so much. So uh, I decided to stay, well, oh, bahala na. That was the bahala na. There was the dare, and it was a dare. Uh, this friend said, how, uh, you try. He said, I'm not successful at the, but I know what a hard time you're having. No heating, no this, no hot, there you go. Um, what, uh, I said, okay, he says, I'll introduce you to my agent, uh, who has not been good with me, my, nobody likes my stuff. So I tried with him, and I was totally unsuccessful the first four, five, six months. Then it clicked, because before I was either too far ahead or too, uh, or behind, okay. And uh, so this is the type of work I was doing uh, for experimentation, that I was experimenting. And it clicked. It clicked, not immediately the great success, but it clicked. And then it went up, 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 till I really hit the very top, which was a whole collection for the god of gods in, in, in this uh, field, which is Balenciaga. Uh, I could have made lots of money on that, really. But then you become a slave, a slave of every three months, a new season, a new set of designs and this and that. And that was not my idea of uh, becoming anything but, I, mean, I wanted to be a painter, not, uh, not a uh, textile designer. So I did a lot uh, while I was studying, but I used a lot, and I'll, I'll show you some of the, I have a lot more of these experimentations that were easily uh, produced or reproduced as a textile design. very much that some people who don't know my works keep on saying that I do always the same things. You've seen now the variety of things I've done and I keep on doing. So that's why I did the 16 gallery exhibition at the Mega Mall and still some people have not seen the shows and they keep on saying the same things, even columnists. <laughs> What happens is that these gentlemen, aside from paying you peanuts, not, not uh, Balenciaga, but the producers, some of these uh, manufacturers, can be real, well, crooks, because they would take your designs and they had a, a one-way mirror and they would put them on their bodies like this to uh, see, pretend that we're seeing how it looked on, on, uh, in the round. And then you would find them, your, your designs in the street or in the stores. It has happened to me.
in any case, uh, there is this rapport with, with the public that I wish were, it were clear that I've not stuck. I'm not stuck, that I've always been experimenting and will always be experimenting. Prints, theater, this, uh, sculpture, all, uh, all these things. So I had to invent my own thing, which was painting on panes of glass, pieces of glass, for the projectors to mm, well, bring out the colors on, onto the people. And then later on, the same effect is reproduced on the singers on the stage. Let's say that the glass bits I used for the projection were about this size, if not larger, about this size. But of course, it was totally impractical. So I decided to reduce it slowly to this size, which is this. So this is the original. This is the original of this. OK. Now, of course, this is an original photograph. And this is an original uh, miniature that is transparent. And so you can use it as a slide. So when I say hand-painted slides, that's what they are. There's no camera involved, none whatever. I have boxes of this stuff, and then I go back and fall in love. Oh, well, look at this, how beautiful. Why don't I continue it? Okay, that's it. <laughs> no great secret is that. Uh, you go by your own uh, feelings, because that's what art is all about. If, if it's not that, well, then it's just illustration, which is very honorable, but it's something else. They say that an illustrator can do what he wants, and an artist, if he's a painter, if he's an artist, can only do what, uh, what he's made of. Each time I changed subjects, or because not because there was a market, because I, I needed it. I have yet to see a humongous mural. I have seen big paintings, but the detailed work that Sanso does, I am just kind of curious. What? a mural, you know, maybe a 10 by 30 mural or something would look like if Sanso does it. That was one of the advantages uh, I had going to Italy. There are lots of fabulous frescoes. I mean, all over. The churches, the palaces, and all that. So already this monumentality 
was very, very striking because we're used to painting paintings at least at that period we could not afford walls or we could not afford big canvases. So uh, that to me was, I mean, uh, really mind blowing. I thought I would be in Europe just one year uh, because that's what my parents said. Okay, you go to Europe, but please come back and this and that. Uh, so it went on for 50 years that every year I was coming back <laughs> for 52 probably. So uh, I went to Paris because the School of Fine Arts in Rome just bored me a little bit and I said, the city is beautiful, it's a museum, but there's a time when I have to go and really face uh, more uh, contemporary ideas and more uh, So I went and got into the um, uh, academic side of things. Luckily, they accepted me uh, in the school, uh, in this uh, academy, but then also I got a bit bored with what they were teaching academically again. So I was looking for something and luckily there was a fresco uh, studio in the school because you need a lot of space and a lot of this. So I went there and the professor was very kind and he accepted me in his, uh, in his uh, class. And uh, well, I started there and I just found it fabulous. And it was totally a, a different approach again from what you do in, in, uh, with, a, in, uh, with an easel and a, a, a thing you can carry around. Then there are other considerations, which were, of course, scale. Of course, you can make smaller frescoes too, but generally it's for monumental things. Now, that is one of the things I tell my younger people or those who are trying to learn how to paint, is that you don't move exactly the same way at each level of should we say magnitude or uh, smallness. Okay, if you are painting a small thing with a fine brush, you move this, right? If you are painting a bigger surface with a bigger brush, you do this. And if it's a bigger one, you do with your elbow. See? And if it's bigger, 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 then it's your arm, or bigger still, it's your swinging your whole body with it. You cannot, with a little small brush, go oh, like that. It's ridiculous. It will look awful. It becomes repetitious because the hand is repetitious. That's the problem with it. Or you fight that monotony of uh, strokes. So that also is a very wonderful lesson for the theater and for other big projects. Well, yes, this was no doubt influenced by all the uh, crucifixions and all the things I'd seen in frescoes, no doubt. The style is not fresco yet. It's still um, easel painting. At that size, you don't have any of the problems of really making something three times or four times your own size. So that represents a lot of problems of uh, uh, perspective and all kinds. Fine. So uh, here is Judas oh, hanging. That's why the feet are so prominent to show they're not uh, standing on, on, on ground. And here's his uh, bag of money that he had received. For the, uh, I don't know how much it was. And uh, so it well, the professor liked it and said, I was still in my, should we call the expressionistic thing, the human factor thing. He said, very much into that. So, and then slowly it went, out when I, of course, this was transferred on to uh, my uh, etchings and drawings like that. Not just fresco, or even more so than fresco, there's, there's very little market for it. So the first time I met him, I remember I was about 11 years old and my father introduced me to, uh, introduced him to me that uh, he's a painter, of course being a child, uh, all I did was got a piece of paper and a ball pen and say here, draw me something if you're an artist and he naturally did it and uh, time went on I, and then I met him again when I was uh, much much older. When I met him, I pulled out the paper, still in a very good piece, uh, in good condition. I showed it to him, and he was surprised. After which, he started uh, telling me about arts and things like that. That attracted me into painting. Of course, uh, it's not only Mr. Sanso who uh, got me into it, but uh, also being able to see 
my father's warehouse with a lot of different paintings got me curious. And it was uh, Tito Jovi who really uh, opened my eyes, understanding how to look at paintings. Okay, one distinct piece is this one. This was the one that I obliged Mr. Sanso when I first met him. And I have kept it all over uh, all the years. This one is Pegatata. It's one of Mr. Sanso's very first few shows done in Makati uh, Commercial Center. Uh, I was also still very young and I remember this piece until when I started collecting, I requested to look for this piece and I found it. Over here are his early works. Um, well, you can see the Montalban. Here particular, this one is uh, Tough Avenue with High Ally over there. And you can see his signature over there is still a full name. He doesn't, he didn't uh, call himself Sanso. Here's a particular piece that I'm very amazed with. He calls it a painting uh, in front of a painting. If you really look at it carefully, it's a piece of um, a subject in front of one of his painting. I'm still looking for that painting. Now, this one is, uh, I just got very attracted with this one because just the look on it, you feel very cold already. This was taken in Paris and then some of his other uh, early works, as you can see, it started brightening up already. This one also is particularly interesting because um, Tito Jovi had his first snow and he was out there painting. I could just imagine he was shivering while doing the painting. And as I was saying, these are, as you can see, the paintings start brightening up. You can see Mr. Uh, Tito Jovi also doing certain different kind of uh, strokes. Uh, there you go again, you can see a different kind of strokes, but these are really uh, some of his uh, paintings that are really coming out. I would always tell people, identifying a painting is not by looking at the signature. Identifying the painting, the painting itself should be the signature. It would be always good that when you see it from afar, you know it's a Sanso. People would ask me, Tito Jovi or Mr. Sanso is always painting stones and flowers and things like that. I said, that's his signature. That's him. Okay. So, and you can see until these latest, these are very colorful already and very much alive. That is Sanso. We would normally have our Sunday lunch together. Of course, my father would uh, joke around with him, as my father would say, concentrate on your business while I concentrate mine. Of course, my father is in retail and Mr. Sanso is into painting. So those kind of uh, discussions really did attract my attention. And I did really try to compare uh, Mr. Sanso with my father's life. Both very different person, but both very close to each other. One day I was watching my father making, uh, doing a speech in a graduation and he called Mall of Asia Complex as his the project or his largest project. So when we were doing the convention center, I thought that what could be a better way to really show people the friendship together was asking Mr. Sanso doing his biggest or largest painting in my father's largest project. And naturally, I know Mr. Sanso this year uh, wants to retire, but I do believe I got him out of retirement by convincing him to continue. And I think people can see it from his painting that it's not only just getting him out of uh, retirement, but really having him express his love for art and having him express the friendship that they have together. Henry C is behind this project 
And I'm very happy that this has happened because it's such a long, wonderful friendship, and I owe him. Uh, really, my first big break up, uh, break out in um, in Manila. I didn't care that much about my career yet. I wasn't thinking in terms of career, which I don't really do that much anyway. But. Uh, I, I didn't even know how, how things went for careers. I didn't uh, how you planned a career. I don't. I still don't know because I've done it all upside down. But anyway, so um, that was a great, really great introduction to the public. So this is coming now after this very wonderful friendship, and uh, well, uh, I hope it, this friendship will last a hundred years more. Okay, but well, let's say ninety-nine. Okay. Evolve his own uh, personal style. You know. uh, of course, he's uh, so well traveled. You know. He's uh, just, just out of the country, goes to Europe, to states. But somehow, uh, his uh, what they call it, genre or his um, uh, body of work, no, are, are so what, uh, interrelated. No? They're uh, rather consistent. No? In, um, of course, they vary through the years. No? And uh, he's one, I think, who doesn't uh, repeat his work. He keeps on um, inventing, reinventing. The first time I saw Sanso, I was really very impressed because uh, he's, he's, uh, he had a show at the Luz Gallery. This is still in Padre Faura, this early 60s, I think. And uh, he came out with the, a, a, a whole exhibition of uh, bouquet, black and white bouquet which is really his, uh, his mark in, in his work and, uh, and his etchings and early works. Uh, it, it did influence us. Actually, during that time, we were copying his style. As I remember correctly, it was an exhibition of uh, prints, of etchings, intaglios, which actually Sanso was very good at. Um, because at that point in time, he had been painting like uh, for oils. They were satirical portraits. And then he went largely in, into printmaking. He actually was able to create a series of, of very outstanding uh, um, prints. The work of Sanso is uh, more on the abstraction rock formation, sponge formation, you know, these are the things that, you know, you can see in, in, uh, in uh, the seaside, you know, but uh, form into a different uh, artistic way, you know, uh, the colors, especially the green one, which, you know, which I use. Uh, yeah, he's um, what they call an example of uh, an artist who is totally dedicated to his craft, which is a very uh, fine example especially among young artists. I think his enthusiasm in his own art, his, uh, you know, his dedication, and uh, he likes to share also to the students. I think he, sometimes he gives lectures, and it's a very, very <laughs> good uh, way to, to part some of your knowledge to students. We artists are really, you know, uh, have some sort of uh, connect, you know, whatever it is, there must be something that, you know, that the artists, you know, have really to live by its others' uh, works, see its other works, you know, and, and really also get inspired by the other artists who are maybe uh, a little senior from us, you know. I think he never runs out of imagination, as well as uh, the energy to create. And that's one thing uh, uh, artists should emulate, you know, they should have the, the capacity to uh, pursue their uh, craft without uh, lit up. Ladies and gentlemen, 
the great mural of the SMX Convention Center, Uvedad Fransos, Tide of Fortune. That's how it started. 